Jesus' name, and everybody says. I want to welcome my neighbors, George and Anna, to God's house today. Where are they, George and Anna? All right, back there, George and Anna. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. As we learned last week, the Holy Spirit, and we're on a study of the Holy Spirit, was active in Jesus' earthly life, beginning with his conception. And we saw in Scripture that the Holy Spirit has also been active in your life, even before you were spiritually conceived, and in the whole process of you becoming a Jesus follower as well, culminating in your salvation, culminating in coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, which was the first step, and the next step is water baptism. Everybody say water baptism. And the Holy Spirit is active in your process of being baptized in water, just like he was active in Jesus' process uh, uh, of being water, baptized in water. And when Jesus went to be baptized, his cousin John the Baptist refused. He said, I'm not worthy to baptize you. How many of you have ever felt that you're not worthy of something? Imagine that the Lord chose you to baptize him. And so John says, I, you know, even though we're cousins, I'm not worthy. But Jesus says this in Matthew 3. It has nothing to do with worthy. It has to do with obedience. And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And how many of you are pleased with Jesus in your life? And we learn a few things here. First of all, who? Everybody say who. Who, who should be baptized? And it's the Jesus follower. According to what we've read and what we'll read in Scripture, uh, if you're following Jesus' example, Jesus was baptized, we should be baptized too. Secondly, what, what is water baptism as they put it on the screen? Water baptism is an outward declaration of an inward decision. It's an outward declaration of an inward decision. So a person recognizes that they need a savior. They, they, they see, they sense, they want to be washed of their sins and they decide, listen, motivated by love and obedience because how many of you know that shame and guilt doesn't get, do any good for anybody? And if you use shame and guilt to get people to do things you want, let me tell you something. They may do it but they're going to do it reluctantly, they're going to resent you, and that change is only going to last a little while. But that's another preaching, quit distracting me, can somebody say amen? amen. So water baptism motivated, motivated by love and obedience to be baptized according to a few biblical mandates that we'll read, but everybody say love. love. So like marriage, uh, a wedding, a wedding ring, a person wants to make it known publicly. Okay, uh, some people will go to Vegas, some people will go to a little chapel, but a lot of people like this to be known. They invite friends, they invite family, they invite witnesses because it's something that they want everyone, like marriage, like baptism, to be publicly known. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, listen to this, Inside and outside, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood to wash our conscience clean. But pastor, I've done this, I've done that. It doesn't matter. Whatever you did, Jesus took it upon himself on the cross. And now he offers you forgiveness and a new life. But then also uh, having our bodies washed with pure water, which we're going to baptize some people in just a few minutes. But then the writer of Hebrews says this, so let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Everybody say profess. For he who promised is faithful. See, there's going to be a public profession in a few moments of those that will be baptized, a profession of faith, okay, denouncing sin, denouncing Satan, denouncing self, and declaring Jesus Christ is now my Lord and Savior. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, this is why Paul tells Timothy, so, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, listen to this, when you made your good confession in the presence of many what? So he's saying, Timmy, remember when I baptized you? 
Remember everything you said in front of all those people? Do you remember when you were baptized? What did you profess? Maybe it was here, maybe it was somewhere else, maybe it was in a, a lake, a river, a pool. But what did you declare? What did you promise God? And then there's obedience. Everybody say obedience. And as Jesus told John the Baptist, this is the right thing to do because this is what Scripture tells us to do, both the New Testament and Old Testament. We have example. Paul refers to the Israelites crossing the Red Sea as their baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We have Old Testament examples of priests being baptized in Exodus and Leviticus, and all this to fulfill righteousness. It's an act of obedience. Two scriptures that straight up don't suggest, but tell us, if you're a Jesus follower, this is what you need to do. Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38 also, when the people heard this, they were cut to the what? How many of you have ever been in a sermon, listening to someone preach, myself, Pastor Henry, Pastor Israel, whoever, and all of a sudden, man, boom, your heart is impacted. Like the Holy Spirit just knocked the wind out of you, and this is what these people are going to, going through. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers and sisters, what shall we do? Why do they ask this question? Not because anybody guilted them, not because anybody shamed them, but because the power of the Holy Spirit combined with the power of the word showed them that they needed to make a change in their lives. So they said, what should we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, this is what you need to do. Repent, which means start changing. Well, I can't, you know, well, change what you can and trust that God will do the rest. Repent and be baptized because they go hand in hand. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we see that the nations, the Gentiles are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Jewish people are to be baptized in the name of Jesus to recognize that he is their promised Messiah. Part of what? Water baptism is an act of love. It's an act of obedience, but it's also symbolic. Everybody say symbolic. Just like this ring is symbolic of Pastor Mona and I belonging to each other. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? The people that are going to be baptized today, this has nothing to do with this church. They're not being baptized into our church. If you say, oh, pastor, when I was a baby, I was already baptized into a church. The Bible doesn't tell us to be baptized into a church. It says we are to be baptized into Jesus. And not only into Jesus, but more importantly, baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised in the tomb from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a what? We too may live a new what? Why do I yell about all these things? I yell about all these things because I tried to change so bad and so hard and it lasted a little bit and I didn't get anywhere. But then I realized when you're baptized, you're baptized into Jesus' death. And when you're baptized into his death, it gives you access to his resurrection, his life, and his power, and when you start living in his life, his power, and his resurrection, that's when you will start seeing true, significant, lasting change in your life. Not only will you see it, but the others around you that are mad at you are going to start seeing it too. When should a Jesus follower be baptized? Well, water baptism, according to what we were reading, should take place right away in a believer's life, according to these scriptures. Where? John the Baptist baptized people in a river. I have baptized people in pools. I will baptize you in your pool if you have a barbecue waiting afterwards. Can somebody say amen? Today, for the very first time, Pastor Veronica is going to baptize four young ladies here in our church baptistry. And all the sisters said... And all the sisters said, I'm every woman. Can somebody say amen this morning? And why? We have said already, 
We get baptized because it's scriptural. Because we want to follow Jesus. Example, because it's an act of love, it's an act of obedience, and also because the water, while it's not magical, it is symbolic of the Jesus follower being buried into Christ's death and resurrecting as a new creation. So our study these weeks, these months, are specifically what is the Holy Spirit's role in certain things we do? And what is the Holy Spirit's role in water baptism? We see a combination of water and spirit. Everybody say water and spirit. Throughout the Bible, water and spirit, water and spirit. Genesis 1, 2. And the spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. Nehemiah 9, 20 says that God gave his people while they were in the desert water and his spirit. Isaiah 44, 3 says that God will pour out water on the thirsty land and pour out his spirit on his offspring. New Testament, Matthew 3, 11, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one, my cousin Jesus is coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. At the end of that chapter, we see as Jesus came out of his baptismal water, the Holy Spirit rested on him. John 3, 5, Nicodemus, because he's embarrassed, he goes to Jesus at night, and he, he says, tell me more about this, and Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And one of the last verses in the Bible, Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, the Spirit and the bride of Christ, the church, invite everyone who is thirsty to drink the free gift of the water of life. And we'll return at the end of our talk today with one more water spirit example. But the key two verses that speak specifically to the Holy Spirit's role in water baptism are these two. First of all, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we are all baptized by one what? As to form one what? Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, San Fernando Pacoima, Dodgers Giants, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Can somebody say amen? amen. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there's one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one what? One baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So this is key. Follow me here. Follow me here. Through water baptism, the Holy Spirit brings us into unity. The Holy Spirit brings us into a unity, a hope, a faith, all under one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is. Through water baptism, the Holy Spirit brings you into the body of Christ and the family of God. Now, we've talked about how the different um, uh, members of the Holy Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, have taken to themselves different responsibilities, different functions. And one of the, whole, one of the Holy Spirit's functions, responsibilities in your life as a Jesus follower is this, as they put it on the screen, God the Spirit is in charge of your, these three things, say them with me, welcoming process, Let, let's work, we got to work on our timing, you ready? Welcoming process, number two, your, as they put it on the screen, your number two, your grafting process, and then number three, your adoption process, everybody say adoption process. So, welcoming project, listen, whether you go to Disneyland, whether you go to the Apple Store, whether you go to Starbucks, or you come to Trinity Church, okay, there's greeters that welcome you when you first come, in our case, when you first come to God's house. And they let you know where everything is. They show you where to go. They show you what to do. The greeters show you how things work. You're new. You're not sure. They, they let you know that we're happy that you're here, in our case, the greeters share the love of the Father and of the Son with you. And all this is just a human, a visible, a tangible, outward sample of what the Holy Spirit does when you first come to Christ. He's your welcoming committee. You're not sure. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. You don't know who to trust. The Holy Spirit is there to take you by the hand and lead you. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit welcomed you when you first came to the family of God? And now that you belong to the family of God, who are you welcoming these days into 
the family of God. I want to tell you something that we are having, like many churches, a hard time finding people to work, finding people to volunteer. Some of our favorite restaurants, it says right there, we don't have the same hours to send menu because we can't get workers. Well, it's kind of the same in God's house. There's something simple that we need help with, that if you want to do this, just call the office during the week and say, Pastor David talked about this, sign me up, we're going to give you a vest, we're going to give you a flag. We got people by the doors, but we, since pandemic, don't have anybody in the parking lots. Stand there, with a, everybody smile. Oh, you're, you're, you're qualified. <laughs> I, I don't know how to talk to people, I don't know how to do this. All you have to do is put on a vest, wave a flag, and just do that. We need your help. We'd love for you to sign up to it. As a matter of fact, they need help in the Spanish. You can come serve at 9 and then sit at 11. Secondly, I want you to say grafting process. They put this picture on the screen. Grafting is to insert a shoot or twig or a branch into a tree. As they leave it on, their grafting is also done with human skin and human limbs to a human body. I prayed about this and I chose to use the agricultural picture instead of the medical <laughs> picture up there. But either one are a very delicate procedure that needs nurturing and monitoring. And Romans 11 says that God, when you accept Jesus into your heart, he grafts you into the body of Christ. He grafts you into the family of God. And the Holy Spirit watches. He nurtures. He nurtures. He cares for us. He monitor us, monitors us during this, listen, this grafting process of adjustment. How many of you know that sometimes grafting, whether it's agricultural or medical, things just go smooth? And how many know other people have complications? Maybe you're here, and maybe, man, you accepted Jesus into your heart, and boom, you're serving God. And then there's other ones like me that went through a period of adjustment. I didn't know what others were thinking of me, and, and, and I didn't know. I didn't always feel welcome, and, and, and on the outside, I might have had a smile, but I was going through so much inside. I'm so grateful that God sends his Holy Spirit inside of me and has led me through a welcoming process and a graphing process to make sure that I'm adjusting, that I'm changing, that I'm growing, and I'm adapting to a new way of thinking, a new way of feeling, a new way of seeing, a new way of believing, and a new way of living. And the goal, the second picture up here, that's you. That's me. This is the end result that we're implanted, that we're attached, that we flourish, that we bear fruit for the glory of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus says this in John 15, 8, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And then... The adoption process. Through water baptism, you are adopted into the family of God. How many of you know adoption is a process? A person doesn't go into an orphanage and say, I'll take that one, that one, and that one, and they walk out with them. It's a whole process, which we'll cover more in a few weeks on the holiest day of the year, Father's Day. Can somebody say, <laughs> and all the brothers said, I like it when you call me Big Papa. Can somebody say amen? amen. We're going to cover your adoption process more on Father's Day. But today, know this. For the baptized Jesus follower, you ready for this? You belong. You belong. 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You now belong to God. And the purpose so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So listen, you believe. You belong. So now you can become like Jesus. As we begin to close, we find the last biblical example of water and spirit. Everybody say water and spirit. 
In Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40, an angel told Philip, one of the early church leaders, to go south on the desert road towards Jerusalem. He was going there to worship. And he met a man, an Ethiopian eunuch on the way. And and this African man, eunuchs were slaves. They were slave men who had been castrated as boys and employed as slaves to serve within the royal palace, but especially to serve and take care of the queens and the princesses because supposedly castrating them would make them safe. They went through this brutal, brutal experience that would scar them for life internally and externally. And the challenge is that even though this eunuch was on his way to Jerusalem, the Old Testament stated that anyone who had a physical deformity could not participate with the rest of the Israelite congregation. So I want you to get the picture. Those of you that are home, those of you that are here, this man was traveling thousands of miles to go worship God, knowing he wouldn't be let inside, knowing that when he came to the doors, nobody would welcome him. As a matter of fact, they would say, no, you, wait outside. You have to worship outside. You have to worship from afar. The Holy Spirit told Philip, go. Go talk to him. Walk alongside the eunuch's chariot. See, he was a treasurer for Queen Candace of Ethiopia. So he gets close, and the eunuch was reading Isaiah 53, what we call today Isaiah 53. Back then, it was just a big, long roll. Philip asked the eunuch, do you you understand what you're reading? He says, no. Can, Can you explain it to me? He says, yes. And Philip began to teach this eunuch about Jesus. In Isaiah 53, it says he was, he was, he was whipped, he was bruised, he was, he, he was tortured, just like you. He was tortured. But he was God's lamb, the sacrifice for our sins. And he began to talk to him about the love and the acceptance of Jesus Christ. And Philip says, Hey, would you like to become a Jesus follower? Would you like to ask Jesus to come into your heart? And he said, Yes, I would. And he led him in a prayer and then There's still some ways to go to Jerusalem. They're in the middle of the desert. So Philip begins teaching him like we read, teach them to obey all I've commanded. And he begins to teach the eunuch about following Jesus and scriptures and the word of God. And and then he gets to the part of water baptism. And in the desert, all of a sudden, there appears, I don't think it was miraculous, I think it was just the Holy Spirit timed it out perfectly like he does in our lives. All of a sudden in the desert, they come across a river. They come across a lake. And the eunuch says, there's water. And he looks at Philip and he says, you know what? Regardless of what I've been told my whole life, that I can't belong, that I can't have a close relationship with God like other people, like normal people, like perfect people. But if what you're saying is true, That God really loves me and wants me to be part of his family. Can you please baptize me into the body of Christ and the family of God? And the Bible says that Philip baptized him. And as soon as Philip baptized him, the Holy Spirit says, now I want you to go somewhere else. And Philip left him and he continued on his way. But this eunuch's life would never be the same. Because a common, everyday Jesus follower, just like you and me, chose to obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Number one, you've been baptized already. And please think about these two things. Number one, as they put it on the screen, your profession and your part. Please say out loud, my profession, my part. I want you to take a moment and think about when you were baptized. What did you publicly say? What did you tell everybody in the crowd? Did you say yes to these questions that Pastor Veronica will ask, that come what may, you're going to be faithful to God, that come what may, you're going to trust God, you're going to love him, you're going to serve him, you're going to tell others about him. And years later today, 
Are you doing your part? Secondly, you're here, you're watching, and you haven't been baptized yet. Friend, God loves you. Just the way you are, he wants you to be part of his family. Today, accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to forgive you of your sin. Get baptized the next time we have baptism, which is in July. We'll teach you all about what it is. You even get a free t-shirt. Somebody say free this morning. Follow Jesus. And we'd love to help you in that journey. Close with this. A surrender Jesus follower is going to do these three things wherever they go, regardless of what they're going through. Number one, obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Number two, produce fruit. And number three, lead others to Christ. And our closing question this morning, what is preventing you from being obedient to the Holy Spirit? And what will you do about it? Do you want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit? I'm going to ask you to please stand. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer. Out loud and out proud, say, Holy Spirit, please help me to be obedient to you so that I can be saved and so that others can be saved and baptized in Jesus' name.